Welcome to Medical Minutes here on Time Warner Cable DMG TV 2. Coming up on this episode, we have Dr. Walter Randolph. He has some updates on osteoporosis. And then Dr. Nate Johnson has more on stroke treatments. Dr. Kurt Guerin also joins us to give us an update on spring allergies. All coming up here on Medical Minutes. Myers & Miller Podiatry provides complete foot and ankle care to patients of all ages. The practice was established in 2000 by Dr. Adam Myers and has grown to include Dr. Andy Miller in 2007 and most recently Dr. Jason Backage in 2010. Our core values of respect and honesty are the basis for how we manage our practice and we have grown by building relationships with our patients in order to better serve their needs. Myers & Miller Podiatry serves Tuscaroras and Holmes County with offices in Dover, Sugar Creek, Newcomerstown, and Millersburg. Let's get started building our relationship. Are you suffering from asthma or emphysema? Do you have shortness of breath or a nagging cough you just can't shake? Hi, this is Dr. Nathan Samsa. I'm originally from Strasburg and I've returned after my medical training to serve the Tuscaroras Valley. I'm board certified in pulmonary medicine and I'm ready to treat your breathing and lung problems. My office is located at Union Internal Medicine Specialties, 515 Union Avenue, Suite 187 in Dover, Ohio. Call me at 330-343-4411 for a timely consultation. Hi, I'm 1450 WJER's Bill Morgan inviting you to join me on television Wednesday evenings at 7 and Friday afternoons at 5 for TV2 Sports Talk. Sports Talk is your weekly look inside high school football, volleyball, soccer, and more. Look for guest appearances from your favorite area coaches and players. TV2 Sports Talk, Wednesday evenings at 7 and Friday afternoons at 5 on DMG Channel 2 on Time Warner Cable. We live in a fast-paced world. Say goodbye to searching books and search engines for all the answers. Now there's iTowns. From finding a place to dine or locating your family doctor, you can also check out the high school game of the week from TV2 Sports. Get your answer with just one click. iTowns has it all. Welcome to Medical Minutes. This time around, we are talking with Dr. Walter Randolph from Dover, and we are talking about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, explain what that is. Most people know it's some kind of bone ailment. Yes, it's a, it's a weakening in the structure of the bone, and um, there are different components to the bone, but the basic explanation, the inner supportive structure becomes weaker, so the bone becomes weaker and is more apt to break or fracture. So there are holes in your bones, even if they're tiny, like porous. Right. It's it's like the, the walls in a building with the supportive structure on the inside. And so what you see with the bone is the, the hard outer part, but the inner bracing does quite a bit to help support the bone as well. How does that deteriorate? There's a balance between rebuilding of the bone and tearing of the bone down. So you're, you're always making fresh bone. Um, if you slide into a time where you're tearing it down faster than you're building it, then you start to lose bone. And then you're at risk for breaking your bones. Correct. And it, it, and it can happen in any bone in your body. That's right. That's right. We, we, we concentrate on the bones that most frequently break, but it does happen everywhere but it's more important, say, in your spine or your hip because it's more likely to break than in your little toe. And osteoporosis is not so much to do with your posture, but you see a lot of older people who may have, uh, you know, be hunched over because of the osteoporosis. Correct, correct. I mean, all of our moms always told us, sit up nice and straight. <laughs> um, but the difference there is with osteoporosis, when the bones start to collapse and they wedge, you can't sit up straight. There's no way because they start 
hunching you over. So is there any treatment when you do have osteoporosis? What do you do for it? First of all, it's going back and, and, and looking to see if someone has it. You know, there are several ways of, of testing for it. The basic test is the bone density test that um, many people have heard of. In looking at the numbers that they have there, we'll kind of separate people out into normal or low bone density or osteoporosis. Uh, osteoporosis itself, there are many treatments uh, for it. Uh, some are pills, some are injections, some are IV infusions, um, nasal sprays even. Um, that you only have to do some of them once a year. Correct, correct. Some are once, uh, we've gotten away from the once a day. Most people don't tolerate it very well, but um, once a week, once a month, twice a year, or even once a year. And that's enough. And that is enough. The, the bones change very slowly. Um, you know, it, it takes years to build them, it takes years to tear them down, so it takes years to repair them as well. So if you're taking the medication, you're not going to go back and look at it in two months and say, wow, look at the big change. Maybe two years or a year you'll start seeing change in it. So the medications actually stay in your system for a long period of time. And what do you tell most of your patients? Or how do you decide what to treat them with? There, there are a variety of factors that come into play there, and I only laugh because there's so many different medications, and, and you know, which one works best may be determined by does the patient have stomach issues and can't take some of the oral medications that cause irritation? Um, have they already had a bone fracture? And if they've already had a fracture, there's a different set of medications we'll use with them. Cost is another issue. You know, the, the, in, the infusions are thousands of dollars. The pills are not. Um, what does insurance d dictate? <laughs> in some, you hate to say that, but it's not so much insurance, but how much are you willing to pay if you have the problem? Um, and uh, so we, we sit down and, and try and figure out what's going to work best with the patient. Um, oral medications, I think, right now are favored on the cost side. But uh, if, you have a, if we have a patient that's not tolerating them, um, then definitely the injectables do work better. And do you ever completely stop the degeneration of bones? No, no. You sort of build it up in your, your teens, and then there's this gradual loss. That, that happens after that. It's more rapid in some than others. <clears throat> Correct, and especially in women. Now we know that estrogen has an effect on the bone and men have a little bit of estrogen too, but they don't lose as much estrogen at menopause. So women hit menopause, estrogen drops off, and they really see an acceleration in their bone loss and that may put them at a higher risk. Is there any way to prevent osteoporosis altogether? It's, it's all lifestyle and diet. Um, making sure that you're, when you're younger, building your bones strong enough. And it's hard to convince the younger age groups to do that. So getting your calcium and vitamin D, weight bearing exercise, you know, getting up, moving, bones grow in response to stress. So if you never stress your bones, they don't get stronger. So if you can be healthy early, you're better off later on. And then later on, continue those same habits. Continue with the D, continue with the calcium. You know, keep pushing that system along because if you give up, it'll come and get you. And you, know, you mentioned exercise as far as diet goes. Should you just drink milk all the time? What, what will do it for you? <laughs> milk is common in milk products because we know there's a lot of calcium and vitamin D in them. Um, many people, as they age, they don't tolerate it as well. So they, they get a little gassy or get a little upset stomach from, from drinking too much milk, so they back off. Uh, what they need to be doing is looking at the calcium supplements, the, the tablets, the chewable chocolate squares. The, there's so many different calcium supplements. Um, they taste better than they used to. They're not the bites of chalk like they used to be. And also looking at vitamin D. If you can't tolerate calcium at all, at least maximize your vitamin D, either in supplement form or with your diet. What does the vitamin D do? Vitamin D helps you absorb the calcium. So you can eat 
all the calcium you want, but if you don't have any vitamin D to help carry it through the doorway, so to speak, you don't absorb it. So they go hand in hand. So you got diet, you have weight bearing exercise, a little sunshine. Sunshine is good, increases your vitamin D levels. Uh, so we're coming up on sunshine in Ohio, so <laughs> it helps. And um, that uh, we know that from people in northern climates tend to have a little bit more osteoporosis. So the sunshine is good. So you can treat it. It's pretty much inevitable, uh, but the severity is pretty much up to your diet and your exercise. Right. What we're trying to do is prevent fractures, hip fractures, uh, spine fractures. They, they're a huge loss to the patient, uh, loss of mobility, and they're a huge burden on the, the health system as far as money. And if we can take little steps early on, we can prevent the big things down the road. All right, all good to know. Dr. <laughs> Walter Randolph of Dover, thanks for being on Medical Minutes. Thanks for having me. A nursing home or your own home, it's good to be home. So call Ember Complete Care for all your home health needs. When you're recovering from illness or injury, our compassionate staff promotes healing in the most comfortable environment of all, your own home. For skilled nursing, physical therapy, wound care, and more. Locally owned and operated, Ember Complete Care has been servicing all of Tuscarora and Coshocton County since 1986, with a yearly average of $75,000 donated back into the community. Call 1-800-462-0909. Ember Complete Care, it's good to be home. We live in a fast-paced world. Say goodbye to searching books and search engines for all the answers. Now there's iTowns. From finding a place to dine or locating your family doctor, you can also check out the high school game of the week from TV2 Sports. Get your answer with just one click. iTowns has it all. Welcome back to DMG TV 2's Medical Minutes. I'm Jennifer Clark, and in this segment, we have Dr. Nate Johnson. He is the Emergency Department Director at Union Hospital, and today we have you on because we want you to tell us all about stroke. Uh, the condition of a stroke can be a, a variety of things. People may not recognize it, but it is, it's one of those, I consider part of those heart disease problems that you really, really have to pay attention to. So what is a stroke? Most of the time, uh, classically, a stroke is a, a symptom or a neurologic deficit, I guess in complicated terms, that's caused typically by a clot in a specific portion of the brain. And it could be any portion of the brain, but usually it's, it's one clot located in one location causing some classic symptoms that, that, that we recognize as stroke type symptoms. And if untreated, you'll die. If, if it's a large enough clot in a large enough part of the brain, Yes, uh, yes, you, you could die from it. There are 800,000 strokes per year in the United States. Of those, 130,000 people do die of a stroke. So most of the time, most of the time they're not fatal. Unfortunately, most of the time or much of the time, they cause permanent disability um, where people are, uh, lose the, uh, the use of one part of their body, whether it be an arm, a leg, or end up with uh, communication difficulty because they slur their speech the rest of their lives. Uh, so yeah, you, you definitely, they can be lethal, but also they're, they're terribly disabling. And it happens pretty frequently in our area. Oh, a absolutely. Um, we are, um, the, the United States Southeast has the highest concentration of strokes per year, but um, here in the Midwest, we have, our, we have a, a pretty good amount of them uh, as well. Uh, it goes along with, with some lifestyle issues, um, diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, smoking, and all of those things, are unfortunately, are things that uh, we see plenty of here. And tell me a little bit about what happens to you when you're, when you're going through it. I mean, you know, your one side doesn't work anymore. Your arm falls off, not off, but your, you know, your leg will, you, you lose that motion. Typically, um, what first starts, most people tell you is they just don't feel well. Um, and then they'll notice that one arm or the other, uh, and it may be the arm, it may be the leg, uh, goes numb or goes weak. They may be slurring their speech. In fact, often it's a family member that, that says, mom was just slurring her speech. She just started out of the blue. 
Um, and Does it, one side of your face droop or anything? Is something that obvious? It depends upon the type, of the part of the brain. Uh, interestingly, often you will get a droop to your face and difficulty with speech, but sometimes you may not have a droop of your face, you just may have difficulty speaking because the part of your brain that, that forms words or understands language is not exactly the same that controls the muscles in your, in your face, although they're very close. You may also get weakness or numbness in your leg. Some strokes are limited to the leg, some strokes involve the leg and the hand, some strokes involve the entire side of the body. Um, some strokes um, cause other symptoms such as dizziness, um, but those are a bit more rare. The classic symptoms are numbness or weakness on one side of the body, and again, it may be limited to one part of one side of the body. So what do you do to treat it? Well, a lot of it depends upon timing. Right now, the, the primary treatment, timing allowed, is a, what we call thrombolytics. And thrombolytics are, it's a drug that basically thins your blood. It breaks down almost every clot in your body that, that may be present at any one time. They're incredibly potent. Um, they have to be used within a certain time period. Basically, you have to come to the hospital so that we can give you that drug within three hours of the onset of your symptoms of stroke. And it's very tightly controlled. Once you're out of the three hour window, the risk of giving you that drug increases. And that risk is, if you get it late, and sometimes, unfortunately, if you get it on time, it can cause bleeding into the brain. And the reason being, that area of your brain that's not getting enough blood flow the blood vessels in that area become somewhat weak, is the best way to put it. Um, they're not doing their job. And so if you break that clot and now there's blood in those blood vessels, they can leak some blood out. So we know that we need to get it within three hours. Um, there, has, there have been some new studies within the past couple of years that say in a specific population, we can get, give that out to four and a half hours. Uh, and, and we've got that tightly managed. We, we, we know exactly who those people are. Uh, there's a checklist that we go down. So, so I like to tell people, get there as soon as you can. Because frankly, if we're going to give it within three hours, there's work we got to do. We've got to draw blood work. We've got to do a very thorough neurologic examination. And we've got to get a CAT scan of your head that shows that there's no bleeding. Because if there's bleeding in the brain, we cannot give you that medication because the bleeding will, will worsen. So we've got to get this job done first. And then if we're still within the time period, you'll, you'll get that medication. Um, and, and again, this, this goes back to our, our association with the Cleveland Clinic because before you get that. Right, that, they help you. There's a kind of a, Absolutely. You know, a, a computer hookup with physicians up at the Cleveland Clinic. It, it's really more of a robot. It's odd to say that it's a, it's a computer system where you're looking at a, a monitor and there is, on the other, other end of this monitor, sitting in the, what's the neurointensive care unit at the Cleveland Clinic, there is a neurointensivist. And this is, this is usually a neurologist who is a world-class expert in stroke. And I just used this yesterday, and uh, the gentleman on there um, came over and spoke with us, and basically the, my patient came in, and within about five minutes of seeing her, um, we, we contacted him. He was actually in the room on the computer waiting for her to come back from CAT scan. And the minute she came in, I introduced the two. He controls the screen. We have a nurse in the room with him. Usually I'm in the room as well, at least to some degree. And he examines this patient with the use of the nurse, and uh, when it was done, he spoke with me and said, look, this particular patient, you know, uh, may or may not need thrombolytics. If we want to give thrombolytics, he orders it. He's on staff. He's on, officially on staff at Union Hospital, um, and he'll order it. And then what we decide if we give thrombolytics is where, what we do next. Do you stay at Union Hospital? Do you go to the Cleveland Clinic? Um, if you're out of that four and a half hour window, there are some options at the Cleveland Clinic to do. And, and in that case, usually what we'll do is we will fly you by helicopter up there um, and they'll do what, what reminds a lot of people of, of a heart cath, where they'll go in through, through a blood vessel, they will sneak a wire up to where the clot is in your brain, and they can actually give the thrombolytics right there into that artery that's blocked. Wow. Um, they don't deal with every patient, but, but a specific uh, number of patients they will do that with. And occasionally, if that doesn't work, they can actually use a small device through that catheter and try to manually remove that clot. So after your stroke, do you recover completely? With the thrombolytics, and, and again, this I wish I could show you the graph yeah. right now. Basically, the earlier in the stroke that you get the thrombolytics, the much better your chance of a full recovery. We've had, we've had two patients we, right now that we've given thrombolytics to in our program, and both of them have had significant, if not amazing, recoveries, uh, almost completely back to normal. Um, that but the doesn't whole have, point is to avoid the stroke in the first place. <laughs> it is. It, it is. And, and look, once it happens, you've got to get to us. Because the problem is if you went to bed, if you're feeling ill, you had some numbness in your leg, and you went to bed, and you woke up in the morning, and you're not better, 
that, that stroke started probably eight hours ago, and there's not really much we can do. You've got to get in right away. And you, you mentioned earlier, you know, watch your cholesterol, watch your diet, watch your blood pressure, all kinds of things that... Your blood sugar if you're diabetic, that's another big issue. And you know, we've hit on these lifestyle changes for years and years. Do people actually follow them? Yes, um, I do. And, and the people who don't sometimes get a fatalistic view where they say, my grandfather said this, I'd rather be dead than be a non-smoker. <laughs> so people make choices. And always call your doctor for advice. Yes, talk to your doctor, and, and unfortunately, one thing I have to tell you is if you've got symptoms and your doctor's on the office, or even if he is, if you've got symptoms of stroke, come to the emergency department and come to the closest emergency department. All right, very good, including Union Hospital's emergency department where Dr. Nate Johnson is the director. Thank you so much for being on DMG TV2's Medical Minutes, and thanks to all our guests for this episode. For DMG TV2, I'm Jennifer Clark. For chronic sinusitis sufferers, the idea of going to the hospital for invasive surgery may deter them from getting help. But thanks to Dr. Kurt Guerin, ENT, those days are over. Dr. Guerin is the first ear, nose, and throat specialist in Northeast Ohio to regularly offer balloon sinuplasty right in the comfort of his own office in Dover. We live in a fast-paced world. Say goodbye to searching books and search engines for all the answers. Now there's iTowns. From finding a place to dine or locating your family doctor, you can also check out the high school game of the week from TV2 Sports. Get your answer with just one click. iTowns has it all. Hi, I'm 1450 WJER's Bill Morgan inviting you to join me on television Wednesday evenings at 7 and Friday afternoons at 5 for TV2 Sports Talk. Sports Talk is your weekly look inside high school football, volleyball, soccer, and more. Look for guest appearances from your favorite area coaches and players. TV2 Sports Talk, Wednesday evenings at 7 and Friday afternoons at 5 on DMG Channel 2 on Time Warner Cable. Welcome back to DMG TV 2's Medical Minutes. I'm Jennifer Clark, and with us today is Dr. Kurt Guerin. He is an ear, nose, and throat specialist. He has an office in Dover and really all over the area. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And we have you on ear, nose, and throat because we want to talk about allergies. Everybody seems to have them. They're allergic to one thing or they have a year-round problem with allergies. What does that mean when, when your patient has an allergy? Well, allergies basically are when your body reacts to something foreign to it, something that it's not used to seeing or something that's not native to the body itself. Whether it be pollens in the air, whether it be your pets, dogs, things along those lines, whether it be simple things like dust, uh, dust mites, foods. A lot of people even have food allergies. So you can't eat wheat or drink milk or eggs, seafood, those things. How do you, you can stay away from those? Correct. I mean, when it comes to food allergies, the best way to do it's avoidance. There's no real other therapy other than to avoid what you're allergic to. Is that why some restaurants or even food labels will say, hey, this is made with peanut oil if you're allergic to peanuts? Yes. That's the only way to really let people know what, what you're getting into. And even some of the things you'll say made in a plant that has peanuts exposed to it because people who have those types of allergies have them so severe that they could be life-threatening if exposed to them, even just the oil on something else. Wow, that's really sensitive. It is. So how do you know if you have an allergy or just you know, a, an isolated reaction to something? Well, if it's like a true allergy, um, if it's terms like the environment and things like that, what you're going to see is you're going to have those types of symptoms. You're going to have the nasal congestion, the, the itchy watery eyes, the runny nose, um, People are miserable. Right. I mean, you'll see people that have swelling underneath their eyes. It'll look black. You'll see them kind of tipping their nose all the time. They'll be using tissues. And, and a lot of times it's going to be seasonal. So you'll kind of know when it's about to come on. So those are the types of things that you're going to know. You know, it's symptomatically defined at first. And then if it becomes a problem that you need to continue to treat, a lot of times we'll go and test people. We'll do either allergy testing on the skin to look for different things in the air, pollens. Um, and then we'll do some blood work or something like that if we want to test for foods. I've heard of the patch testing where you have 
I'm exaggerating, you know, 50 patches on their back to test to see what they're allergic to because you don't know. What's that like? Well, you know, they've gotten a lot more sophisticated with it. In the old days, they used to use needles and every single one was one in individual needle stick. Nowadays, with what you're talking about, like the patch testing, we call it a multi-test, and each one, there's like eight little prongs on the back of a piece of plastic, and it just basically barely breaks the skin with the allergen on top of it, and we just kind of watch you react to it. Is that the best way to figure out what you're allergic to? Uh, it's not necessarily always the best way, but it's the easiest and simplest way. When do you go see a doctor? Well, what I always tell, them to tell people is you see, come see a doctor after the things that you can take over the counter have failed. Um, there's plenty of antihistamines out there over the counter that work quite well for a lot of people to control their symptoms. I don't, in general, end up seeing the patients in my office until they've tried different things and they say, hey, this isn't getting any better. I need to see a specialist about this. Yeah, but I have no patience for that. Uh, you know, I've, I've <laughs> dealt with allergies with my children and, you know, we keep trying one after another after another. It's really frustrating. Is there any quick answer? <laughs> uh, I wish there was a quick answer. If it was a quick answer, I'd be out of a job, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, more times than not, most people who have allergies do have pretty good control with just the over the counter medications. Keeping in mind that the ones, like I said, that I see that come in are the ones that have failed the over counter medications. In that case, a lot of times what we do, we take the history, kind of discuss different things. A lot of different simple medications we use. We use nasal steroid sprays to try and control the inflammation in the nose. Just like the over counter antihistamines that you see, the Zyrtec, the Claret, and the Allegra, we have a little bit more potent ones that we write prescriptions for. We also have some nasal sprays that we can use that have antihistamines in them. And then if you keep going further like that, we have even more potent and stronger medications, some that, some that will work with allergies as well as asthma that kind of combine since we see a lot of patients that have both. And then if you keep failing all these medications, then we do get to the allergy testing, and then we talk about immunotherapy if it's appropriate, which is the allergy shots that people talk about. Uh, yeah, I've heard of those where you do, you, these shots are supposed to last at least a few weeks. What happens if they don't? What happens if there's always that, oh, okay, this worked for a little while and now mm. it doesn't work anymore. Well, the true allergy shots, the immunotherapy that we're trying to take, where we take the allergens you're allergic to, start out in very, very low doses and kind of build it up inside your system. We start those out weekly. And what you're doing is you're actually introducing into the person's body, into their system, what they're allergic to, to kind of train the immune system, if you will, to not react to it. And those we do weekly and they kind of build up over time and you get to a point then that your body stops reacting to the allergens in the air that you're exposed to, and that's how those work. The shots that you're probably talking about are the catalog shots that everybody kind of brings up. Um, those aren't things we routinely do. Those are people who are very, very severe because they're steroids and there can be some side effects. Those supposedly last about six months. It seems like lately around here with the Tuscarawas Valley, the way it is, Sinus Valley. Um, I've don't heard that. We do so live in Sinus Valley. <laughs> yes, we do. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where where we live because of the way the river runs through it, the way the, the hills are around us, and actually part of just kind of the way the wind blows is that a lot of pollen kind of settles in here and it stays. So we catch a lot of other people's pollens and we don't share it with anybody else. Oh, terrific. Now, can you develop an allergy later in life or do you have it your whole life? It's very common to develop allergies later in life. Um, the more you're exposed to something, whether it be in you know, the environment, the pine trees, the oak trees, the grasses, the weeds, you know, pets, you know, animals, things like that, that your body can over time start to develop the sensitivity just from being exposed to it. So it's not uncommon for somebody, you know, even in the middle of their life to come in and say, geez, I never had allergy symptoms before ever, and now I'm having them. And one other quirky thing about allergies, you might be allergic to cats, but not to dogs. And you, how do you, how are you only allergic to pollen or only allergic to animals? Why, why is that different? Each one has a very specific allergen or antigen inside of them. And so you can be allergic to one type of grass and no other grasses. And some of them will cross react a little bit so that you can, might be allergic to this one and a couple other ones. But for the most part, when you start dealing with the separate proteins and the separate uh, entities, they're all going to be different. So that's why we test for each one. When you said all the number that we put on is, you know, when you talk about you could be allergic to cats, you could be allergic to dogs. I mean, we see people running allergic to horses, rabbits, even guinea pigs. And they can be allergic to one or all of them or, you know, a mixture of them. And the only way to prevent it is to avoid it. Right. When it comes down to that, it's to avoid it. In, in this area, the only way to really prevent true allergies is to live in a bubble. <laughs> or, or move. <laughs> and well, we don't want people moving. Uh, and I've heard that too. Some people move to a more arid climate that mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's less, but you can never really avoid it completely. Right. And even moving away from a climate that's high in allergens, if you have a high propensity to have allergies, if your body's built that way, if you will, then what happens when you move someplace else, you're going to end up eventually developing allergies to the new things you're exposed to. 
All right, well, we'll have to make sure that if we have an allergy, try everything you can, and if it really continues to be just terrible, then that's when you go see your doctor. Correct. All right, very good. Dr. Kurt Guerin, an ear, nose, and throat specialist based here in Dover, our guest here on DMG TV2's Medical Minutes, and I'm Jennifer Clark.